You have to hold this fairly close to your mouth, okay? If you're wondering why this stool, Sarah borrowed it from Clara. It's Clara's music stool, but I won't make you sing, and better yet, I won't sing for you. Uh, and the reason I need the stool is that some years ago we had painters coming to the house and I saw one little trim board that needed replacing. So I crawled up on one of those four-legged step ladders, which later I've been told never use those because they're too unstable, but it tipped over and I fell off and stuck my leg through it and broke my leg. You're going to have to hold the microphone close. And I, I, I couldn't call Bissy, my wife, she was in the house and couldn't hear me. But I, a neighbor was in the yard and I said, Jack, I think I broke my leg. And he came up and said, no, you didn't break your leg. Then he saw I was turned around the other way and he said, maybe you broke your leg. <laughs> so uh, then that's why, one of the reasons. The other reason I had, a, I had a seizure in 2011 and I fell down and my wife called an ambulance. And apparently I didn't want to go to the hospital because it took the two emergency corpsman driving the ambulance and a local fire department and a local constable and a neighbor to get me into the ambulance and in the process I broke my left ankle so that's why I need the stool what I'm going to do today is tell you the story I've told it to some of the people in the room but don't worry I don't write down stories and memorize them I just tell them as, as I remember them so you may hear different things last time I talked to you I told you about the night that my wife and I had dinner in the Grimaldi Palace in Monte Carlo with Prince Rainier and, and Grace Kelly. And we were talking about that the other evening and she said, do you remember when we went to the memorial service in the, in the cathedral in Monte Carlo? I said, oh, I'd forgotten about that. And what she was talking about is that during the service, because this was a service in honor of John F. Kennedy after his assassination, and because he was a president and he'd been in the Navy, we got up front seats. We, we sat in the pew right behind Prince Rainier and Grace Kelly. And then during the service, my wife kept, and I, so I looked down and Prince Rainier was standing on his tiptoe. And if you've ever been to a Catholic mass, you knew he'd stand up and sit down all the time. But every time he stood up, he stood on tiptoes to be as tall as Grace. And I thought, we got home, I thought, boy, what a shame. The absolute monarch of one of the richer countries in the world, and he has to stand on tiptoe to be as tall as his wife. Um, and then that evening, we went to a banquet in the, in the palace, and uh, it turned out we sat right across the aisle, right across the table from Grace Kelly, and we had a really wonderful time. My wife told about teaching in, in a, an a Cajun school in South Louisiana and how the first day a little boy had brought her a baby alligator. And I told about visiting prisoners because one of my jobs was to visit Americans held in French prisons. And by the way, never go in a French prison. I mean, run for your life because you will not survive a French prison. And then I told about visiting French prisons and Grace Kelly told us about making movies with Gary Cooper and, and uh, Bing Crosby and all the other stars. And we had a great time. We just laughed and had a wonderful time. And on Monday then, the, our, my commander called me and said, you know, for such a somber occasion, you people were having a wonderful time laughing. And I said, well, it's not our fault. Grace Kelly made us do it. So. But I'm not gonna tell you that story. Today. I'm gonna tell you the story about the day Fred Yeb died in the Valley of Marbles. We had a, I was stationed at something called the Naval Support Activity. It's a little support activity. It was there to support the staff and the people who served on the flagship for the commander of the Sixth Fleet. Sixth Fleet is kind of a funny fleet. It's a paper fleet. Usually it has one ship in the fleet, but anytime a ship sails into the Mediterranean, they automatically get attached to the Sixth Fleet. So you might have 50 ships one day and one ship a week later. So we, we worked them directly for, we didn't work for them, but we supported all of the, the people who lived there and were on the, on the flagship and on the Admiral staff. We had a, a little commissary store and, and exchange. We had a post office, we had a library, we had a housing unit that brought in people's goods. We had uh, all kinds of things. We had a little hospital, we had a doctor and a nurse and some corpsmen, and we rented a floor in the British hospital so we, we had all those kind of facilities. Also, the chief corpsman, Chief Arnold, was the scoutmaster. And when he got transferred, he said to me, would you take over the scout troop? 
and I, I was happy to do it. I, I've, all my life I've volunteered for stuff and I found most of the time it's the best thing to do because you get new experiences. But anyway, I, I volunteered for the scout troop. It was a pretty good sized troop, maybe 20 boys. And a long weekend was coming up the following month, so we agreed that we would all go on a long camping trip that weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So I talked to one of the French employees, I don't remember his name, I think it was Rene something. He was very well known locally because he was a communist, he was a member of the Communist Party, and he talked his boss into closing the naval support activity for the communist holiday, May 1st. Later a friend of mine said, you know, you're the only Navy activity in the world that closed for communist holiday. But anyway, I talked to Rene, he was a real historian, really knew stuff, and I said, where should we go? And he said, well, take your boys to the Valley of Marbles, the Valley de Marbeau. And he said, it's the most unusual place in France, maybe the most unusual place in the world. And when I asked him why, he said, well, people have lived there for 30 or 40,000 years, and there's a huge, system of tunnels and caves that you can explore. Nobody goes in there because it's owned by the French government and nobody's allowed in there. So I said, well, how do we get in there? He said, well, you have to ask the Southern commander, Colonel Ombear, for permission. So just by luck, we were having lunch the following week with Colonel Ombear. So after lunch, I said, Colonel, we'd like to visit the Valley of Marbles, but I understand it's forbidden to go in there. And he said, oh, don't worry. Everything is forbidden in France. Just go in there. <laughs> and he said, if anybody says anything to you, tell them you have Colonel Umber's permission. So we loaded all the boys. I think there were about 15 of us. And uh, I had two assistant scoutmasters. One was Nick Leonovich. Nick was a bodybuilder. He was actually a missionary. And he, uh, he was, worked at something called Radio Monte Carlo, where they broadcast Christian services over the airwaves, but Nick was also a bodybuilder. So whenever we, I visited him in the studio a couple of times, he's always lifting weights. And then we invited him to his house one night, and he and his wife, a little girl came over, and all through the meal, he kept tensing his muscles. And afterwards, my wife said, is that guy sick, he's twitching? And I said, no, he's a bodybuilder, and he's just keeping his muscles tense to keep his muscle tone up. Uh, but Nick was broadcasting that day, so he couldn't go. So I took Fred Yev, Fred was a very interesting man. I thought he was an old guy. He was in his 60s by then. And uh, Fred had grown up in Russia. And he said, we were from a very wealthy family. We had a huge estate outside of Moscow. And he said, one day, two truckloads of soldiers came. They knocked on the door. They walked in the house. They put a soldier in every room. And they said, you have one hour. Each person can pack one suitcase and leave Russia forever. So I said, we'd been expecting this for, for years, so my mother had been sewing gold coins and, and gemstones into the linings of our coats. And they said, they took us to the airport with our one suitcase and our coats full of, full of money to the airport, and they put us on the first airplane, which was going to Cuba. So he said, we got off the plane in Cuba, and he said, my family was very industrious. We opened a couple more restaurants that had been our business, and had become very successful, owned a huge estate in, in Havana, and he said, one day, two truckloads of soldiers came in. They said, you have one hour to pack your suitcases and leave. And on that particular day, the first plane out was going to Paris. So the family ended up in Paris. At the, and Fred came to me and he said, you know, I was a scout in Russia, and I was a scoutmaster in Cuba. I'd like to be assistant scoutmaster. And he was really a godsend, because he knew everything. He knew about camping and ropes and anything you ask, Fred knew about it. And, uh, the boys considered him an old guy too, and they liked me because I was kind of like an uncle. You know, I was I was like 25 years old, and their dads were all in their 30s and 40s. So I was I was like an uncle. You know, uncle is like a dad, but way cooler. So the boys really liked me a lot. So we got along great. But we took Fred along. He he was he now made his living. He was the only member of the family left, and he made his living washing dishes in a restaurant in Nice. It's the only thing left for him to do. But we started out and we had a Navy truck. It was a big, big truck, 15 passenger van. So we had all the boys in, there was a big roof rack. We put all the luggage and the tents on the roof rack and started out. Now at that particular time, there were still borders between the countries. To get to the Valley of Marbles, we had to drive north of Nice about 100 miles and the road ran along the French-Italian border. We had a, a special form that you had to fill out and get stamped by the local police and everything. It's a long folded piece of paper called a triptych. 
And so we went back and forth across the border following this road and every time they'd read the thing and they'd initial it and stamp it and we'd go. We got to the very last checkpoint. We were in Italy going back to France and the guard said, wait a minute, you can't go back into France because your trip ticket is filled out wrong and you don't have permission to go back to France. You must stay in Italy. So he said, I will call my superior officer. He'll come and decide what to do with you. So we just parked by the side of the parking lot and after a while we heard the siren. You know, sirens in Europe are, they're not like American sirens. There they go, beep, 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 beep. And we heard this far away, this siren coming and, and a big French, uh, uh, Italian staff car came driving in the parking lot. It was going so fast, it slid all the way across the parking lot before it stopped. And this Italian major got out, cleaned off his uniform, went over and started talking to the gate guard and, and as he talked, I could see the major was shaking his head. And finally, he, he grabbed the paper out of the guard's hand, came over and said, I am so sorry. I give you the apologies of the Italian government and the Italian army. He said, obviously, this was a clerical error. He said, I've amended it with my pen, and now you can go safely back into France. He said, that one is too stupid to live. <laughs> so we went out and the guard of course saluted us in the Italian style, which is kind of like that. And we went to the Valley of Marvels. When we got there, there was a huge sign that said, absolutely forbidden. No one entered. On the pain of death, do not enter. Fred was very scared and I said, no, no, Colonel Umber said we could go in there. So we opened the gate and drove in. We had not driven maybe two miles before a, f a Jeep came up and it was a army lieutenant, French, uh, French army lieutenant and a driver. And in the back seat were two guys in full battle gear carrying Thompson submachine guns, the ones with the big 50 round clips. And he said in French to us, who the devil are you and where do you think you're going? So we explained we were Boy Scouts and we had a troop and he, he kept shaking, he said no, no, and pointing for us to get out. And finally I said, well, we have Colonel Ombert's permission. And he said, we, oui, Colonel Ombert. And he saluted and he said, please proceed. Please enjoy your stay in the Valley of Marvels. <coughs> I, the boys were so impressed. They said, Mr. Seaver said, everybody knows you. <laughs> but then by that time, because we'd been delayed at the border and delayed with the guys with the machine guns, it was quite late. We drove up this mountain road, terrible road. A couple places we had to get out and take rock slides off the road. One place we had to hook the truck up and pull a, a tree off the road. So it was almost dark when we got to the Valley of Marbles. We had to walk the last mile or two. And we, we walked out to the edge of it. It was a beautiful alpine valley. Mountains on either side and Mount Bogue in the, in the distance. And up the center of this valley was a huge glacier. There wasn't much snow on the glacier, so you could see it glinting in the afternoon sunlight. Beautiful sight. The boys were just in awe. It takes a lot to silence 12, 11, 12, and 13-year-old boys, but they just stood there in astonishment at the beauty of this valley. We uh, set up a camp, and it was so late we'd intended to go into the caverns, but it was dark by that time. So I told the boys, well, just start some campfires, and we'll cook a meal, and in the morning we'll go into the caves. So we just got the campfires lit and the tents up, and we heard heavy trucks coming. And up from the same road we'd been on, but because they were big, heavy, four-wheel drive vehicles, these trucks kept coming. And it was the same Jeep with the same lieutenant and the same two armed guards, and two big trucks, you know, the kind with the backs like a covered wagon, troop carrier trucks. And they stopped in front of us, and the lieutenant came up and said, our commanding officer has sent us to prepare dinner for Colonel Ombert's guests. <laughs> So they said, this is a French army field kitchen, and we're gonna set it up now and cook dinner for you. Just relax, and we'll call you when dinner's ready. So they set up this huge tent, and two chefs got out of the truck. They had their tall caps, and one started baking pastry, and one started cooking the meal. And then they set up a mess tent, and they put a wooden floor down, and they rolled up the sides of the mess tent, unfolded chairs, so there was a chair for every one of us. And then about 45 minutes later, the lieutenant came over and said, your dinner is ready, please be seated. So they put us in the tent, and the boys said, Mr. Severson, you know everybody. <laughs> but then at the end of the meal, they said, now we're going to go back to the base, but when you get a chance, would you please tell Colonel Ombert that we fixed dinner for his guests? <laughs> so that was a wonderful meal, and as they were leaving, one of the, dri the driver of the Jeep came up with a big box. He said, the chefs have also prepared breakfast. In the morning, if you'll just reheat these things, it'll be breakfast for you. So in the morning, we got up and we went to the, went to the caverns. They were huge caverns. 
and they'd been people had lived in them for nobody knows for sure but perhaps 40,000 years so Fred said well let's rope everybody together it's gonna be dark in there the boys didn't like it he said we're grown-ups we don't need a rope but Fred tied us all together and I had, was the head of the line and Fred was at the end with about 15 boys between us but once we got in the caverns I think they were happy to have that rope because it was absolutely pitch dark in the caverns but we told the boys it's gonna be dark so everybody had a flashlight with fresh batteries and we went into the first cavern, which was huge, much bigger than this room, much taller. And you could tell that people had lived there for centuries because there were remains of old campfires. And at the end of the cavern was a, was an entrance to a cave. We went into the cave and we were in that system of caves for maybe an hour and a half. And they would be, sometimes they narrowed to just barely squeeze through, sometimes it opened. Once it opened into a cavern, it was so big our flashlights could not reach the top of, this, of the cavern. It's like a cathedral. And some, some of the caverns had lakes in the bottom, some had running water, and there, there, were, there were white fish and white spiders and, and uh, other kinds of, because in the total darkness, the animals have no need for color. Blind white fish. Uh, you know, as I told you before, it takes a lot to silence 11, 12, and 13 year old boys, but they were absolutely silent through the whole thing. In fact, before we were in the second or third cavern, everybody was speaking whispers. Even Fred and I, we whispering because it was so awe-inspiring. And then we got to one of the bigger caverns. We all turned on our flashlights and the walls were covered with paintings. There were paintings of bison, ibex, you know, goats that have horns that sweep back, uh, animals that look like tigers, animals that look like lions, and hunters with spears chasing these animals. Uh, every cave from then on had these wonderful drawings. And even though they've been painted 30 or 40,000 years ago, the oil was so fresh and blessing. It looked like the painters had been there yesterday. And of course, nobody else had been in these caverns because the French army kept everybody out. So it was like going in some place nobody had been in for you know, centuries. And uh, we traveled through the caverns. We only traveled for about an hour and a half. And Fred, at the very back of the line, had a piece of chalk. When we went into a different cavern, he'd mark on the wall where we'd been so we could find our way back out again. And uh, after we were in for about two hours and we were deep in the caverns, and we, we went back the other way with Fred leading the way. And it was just as astonishing going out. Every time your flashlight would see one of those glistening paintings. I read later that those artists who painted them were so skilled that they understood cave acoustics. So ever there was a real vivid painting, that was a sound focal point in the cavern. So if they'd give a chant or beat a drum, it would echo through the whole cavern. It was a very interesting day. And I, I, Rene, the guy who told me about it, was right. We never saw anything like it. I never seen anything like it in my life. I'm sure those boys never saw anything like those caverns. But by the time we got out and had lunch, then it was, time, it was, it was noon. And we decided we'd explore on the avalanche. But we had to, some of the boys wanted to get their merit badge for semaphore, you know, signaling. You do it with, 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 with you send Morse code with flags, you know, different things. So Fred took half the boys to one side of the valley, and I took half the boys to the other. We climbed up until we were on high cliffs, maybe half a mile apart. Then the boys started semaphoring. And Fred and I had, had sheets to grade them and we had to grade them on how well they sent and grade them how well they interpreted and they'd write down the messages so we, we graded them on. It took a couple hours for all the boys who wanted that merit badge and then uh, they finished and I, I said tell them we'll go back to camp and then one of the boys signaled something and I said what's he saying? He said Fred's going to show us how to slide down the glacier. <laughs> so Fred crawled down the cliff and the boy everybody we sat down to watch and Fred sat down, and for a while he had to kind of push himself, but then he got going, and it was fairly slippery. Pretty soon he was going at a good clip down the glacier. <laughs> we could see suddenly he was trying to steer. He was throwing himself to the left, throwing himself to the right. We didn't know why he was trying to move. Then we saw ahead of him there was a huge spike of granite sticking up out of the ice, and he was headed right for it. And he finally gave up. He couldn't change course, and he smashed right into it, and he fell back completely unconscious. So the, one of the boys on the other side said, before, what do we do now? <laughs> so I said, tell him to go down and see if Fred's injured. Has he broken bones or is he bleeding or anything? So they scrambled down, slipped and fell, got down to where he is. And I could hear him listening to his heartbeat, feeling his pulse. 
And finally one boy stepped to the side and he took his semaphore and he semaphored something and I said, what did he say? He said, Mr. Yev is dead. So I said, are you sure? Check again. So the boy went down, checked again, and semaphored, yes. And so he said, what do we do now? So I said, well, go now and see if you can make him comfortable. Cover him with a blanket and see if you can slide him down the slope and we'll come around and meet you at the bottom of the slope and carry him back to camp. By now it was getting fairly dark late in the afternoon. So we got they got him to the bottom of the glacier where there was a lake and a, a stream. And I, I looked at Fred and there were no broken bones, he was not bleeding, but I did discover a very faint heartbeat. His complexion was completely white, just chalk white, but I could hear a very faint heartbeat. And when I used the little signal mirror that the scouts all carry, I could see a tiny bit of breath. So he was still alive, barely. So we, we made a, a thing to carry him in and all the boys helped me. We carried him back to camp and we put him in his cot and covered him with blankets. I did not dare try and drive down the mountain road in the dark. It was bad enough in daylight, but I knew we could never get off it in the dark. So I said to the boys, well, can't pick, pack what you can, eat something, and then as soon as it's first light, we'll get up and we'll take Fred in and we'll find the hospital. Now I could tell the boys had a hard time getting to sleep. And they kept saying, anything we can do? I said, well, if you feel like it, you can pray for Fred. That's about all we can do. And in the morning, we recovered Fred. He was still breathing, this very shallow breathing. He was still completely pale. Uh, I could hear this very faint heartbeat when I listened carefully. And I stayed awake till about 2 o'clock. I, I was worried about Fred, but I was more worried about myself. Because you know, if you're driving to France and a policeman stops you and you have a dead body in the car, <laughs> your life is over, your life is over. And I thought, man, I've only been married a couple years, every day is a honeymoon, and I, I hate to go to a French prison. And then, uh, incidentally, we've been married 53 years, and it's still the same way. I feel like every day is a honeymoon, which is a, a nice feeling. Anyway, I, I went to, finally about two o'clock, I fell asleep. And when I woke up in the morning, Fred was awake, sitting on the edge of his cot. And I said, how do you feel, Fred? He said, not real good. <laughs> I said, well, we're, we're gonna break camp, and we're gonna take you and find the hospital. He said, oh, no, he said, don't. I'll stay in camp, you take the boys up and explore the glacier, and we'll go home at noon like we planned. So I said, no, we have to get you to a doctor. Oh, no, Fred said, I insist. The boys will never see anything like this valley in their whole life because there were a lot of petroglyphs in the valleys, carvings in the rocks, and, and there was a ro one petroglyph that looked like drawings of Jesus, there was one petroglyph that looked like a man with a helmet, like a spaceman with a helmet and spacesuits, and these all went back like 20, 30, 40,000 years ago they carved these petroglyphs. In fact, that whole valley was considered a, a place of dread by the Catholic Church, so people weren't, even if they could get permission to go in, were not allowed to go there. But Fred finally convinced me that we should explore the glacier. So he said, I'll stay in camp, make me some hot tea, and I'll just wait here. So we got him a folding chair and, and covered him with some blankets, and we went up and explored the glacier, which was really fun, because it was full of caves and, and places you could crawl through the glacier and big holes in the glacier where you could go down on a rope and explore. We spent most of the morning exploring the glacier, and then we decided to go home. So on, on the way back, then, I started looking for a hospital and Fred said, no, I'm, I'm feeling okay, let's, let's go back and, and go back to the school where the, the parents will be waiting for their sons. So we, we finally went back to, to Villafranche Samir, that's where the base, that naval activity was. And Fred, we met the parents and I said to Fred, well, I'll take you home and maybe we can find a doctor in Nice. He said, no, I don't need a doctor, just get me to my apartment and let me rest a couple of days. He said, I won't go to work tomorrow. If I feel worse, I'll go to a doctor. So I took Fred. I, Fred stopped coming to Boy Scouts. He only came once in a while. From the rest of his life, as long as I knew him, he walked with a limp and used a cane. So I think it was a pretty tough on him experience. Um, about four months later, I got orders back to the United States. So I never saw Fred again. I, I, I should have kept in touch with him because I don't know what happened to Fred. He just was a very interesting person. And uh, I've often wondered, I wonder if really that that weekend in the Valley of Marvels we might have witnessed a real miracle. And that's that's about all I have. So.